Welcome to the Mad in America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry, and social justice. Hello, this is James, and welcome to the podcast. Thank you for joining us today. And our guest for this episode is Justin Garson. Justin is a professor of philosophy at Hunter College and the Graduate Center, City University of New York, and a contributor for Psychology Today and E.ON. He writes on the philosophy of madness, the evolution of the mind, and purpose in nature. His most recent book is Madness, a philosophical exploration published by Oxford University Press in 2022. He is also the author of the forthcoming The Madness Pill, The Quest to Create Insanity, and One Doctor's Discovery that Transformed Psychiatry, which will be published by St. Martin's Press. In this interview, Justin joins us to talk about the ways in which society has attempted to explain or categorise madness over the years. We also discuss the value of looking at madness not as disease or defect, but as a designed feature. Justin, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me today for the Mad in America podcast. And um, I have to say, I'm, I'm delighted to get to chat with you about your work and, and your latest book. So, uh, so welcome. Yeah, thank you so much, James. I'm really, uh, really happy to be here. Great, thank you. So, um, to get us underway, um, we'll come on in a little bit to talk about your latest book, if that's okay. But to begin with, I'd like to ask a little bit about you. So, you're a professor of philosophy at Hunter College in New York, and you have a, a particular interest in studying madness, uh, the evolution of mind and purpose in nature. You're also an author, and you've written on topics such as aging, genetics, mental representation, biological functions, mechanisms in science, and the concept of information in neuroscience. So your work is often at the intersection of philosophy, madness, and biological function. So what was it that led to your interest in these subjects? Well, my interest in psychiatry and madness is really uh, lifelong. Uh, a few months after I was born, my dad was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. He was working under Richard Nixon at the time, and I think that that had something to do with it. Uh, Nixon was famous for surveilling his staff, and I think that my dad was surveilled at one point. Uh, but I think that th that the stress of that triggered a series of psychotic episodes. Uh, he was hospitalized. He was able to return to work, uh, but about 10 years Later, he had similar episodes that really made it impossible for him to continue uh, working. And so I spent a lot of my teenage years visiting him in various mental hospitals, uh, St. Elizabeth's in Washington, uh, D.C., and getting a very clear glimpse of the toll of the cycle of hospitalization, labeling, drugging, eventually getting out, eventually getting rehospitalized, labeled, drugged, and so on. Uh, and then at 16, I was hospitalized for depression for about six weeks. Uh, and I got firsthand experience of what it's like to literally not be able to walk off the premises of a hospital because a doctor doesn't think that you're fit to uh, 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 leave. And I was also put on Prozac. This was the late 80s. So at the time, it was still considered this wonder drug. It was going to reverse the chemical imbalance that causes uh, depression. Uh, so by the time I was 16, I'd probably seen more of the inner workings of psychiatry than anyone really, uh, anyone really should. So around uh, 2000, I was a graduate student in philosophy, and I wanted to explore some of these questions from a more philosophical and historical uh, point of view. And one of the big philosophical questions at the time is what they call the demarcation problem. Namely, how do you distinguish madness or mental illness from any other kind of socially disvalued behavior? So why do we call schizophrenia a mental disorder, but not believing in conspiracy theories? Why do we consider uh, depression a mental disorder, but not uh, jealousy? And at the time, and I suppose this is still true, if you ask a lot of psychiatrists this question, you know, how do you really decide whether something is a mental disorder rather than just something that's socially disvalued? A lot of them would say, well, in order for something to be a mental disorder like schizophrenia or depression, 
there has to be something objectively not working right inside that person. There has to be something in their mind or in their brain that's just not functioning the way that it's supposed to. And that's what distinguishes depression from, you know, just ordinary jealousy or, or grief. But then, of course, if you're a philosopher, you're, you're going to have one more question, namely, well, how do you decide what's functional and what's dysfunctional? Kind of who gets to decide whose brain or mind is functioning well and whose brain or mind is functioning poorly? And are you sure that's not just a, a, a kind of concealed way of introducing these value uh, judgments? And usually those kinds of questions were met with complete silence. So uh, I started getting very interested in, uh, as a philosopher in thinking about, well, what are biological dysfunctions and what are uh, functions? When a, when a, a biologist says the function of zebra stripes is camouflage. What do they mean by function and dysfunction? Let's figure out what that means on a biological level and then think about how it might apply to psychiatry. From there, I got very interested in conceptual problems of biology. So I got interested in function. I got interested in the concept of information in neuroscience. I got interested in the concept of aging whether evolution can help us understand the human mind. Uh, so it's only in the last several years that I've finally been able to work my way back to my primary interest, which is paradigms in psychiatry and how we think about madness as a society. Great. Thank you. That, that, that's really helpful. And, and again, just before we kind of come on uh, to talk about the book, so I'm interested in your choice of the term madness rather than mental illness or disorder or mental health or, or whatever it, it might be. So you, you've written that using the term madness is your preference. So I, I wondered if we could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks. I mean, as you know, the term madness has been or is in the process of being uh, re reappropriated or reclaimed. It's at least in many circles, it's no longer considered a derogatory term. So we can talk about the mad pride movement. It connotes something like difference, perhaps surprising difference, perhaps sometimes harmful <laughs> kinds of differences, perhaps sometimes insightful kinds of differences. But secondly, it seems to me when you describe something as a mental disorder or a mental illness, you're already presupposing that this phenomenon falls under the authority of medicine, that it's the doctor's job to uh, deal with. And that's, of course, an assumption that I want to put into question. So there's something to me which would be very wrong about using a term like mental illness or mental disorder to help explore the philosophy and history of psychiatry when that term just reinforces this assumption that I want to uh, that I want to challenge. I'd like to to go on to talk about your 2022 book, uh, which is entitled Madness of Philosophical Exploration, and it was published by Oxford University Press. And I have to say, it's a fascinating journey through the many ways in which society has attempted to explain or, or categorize madness over the years. And as I mentioned to you before, you know, it's one of those books that I found myself reading, and after every four or five pages or so, I'd have to put it down and have a good think about what I what I just read. That to me is the sign of quite a meaningful book, really, that I had to kind of consider. So, um, for example, in the book, you recount that the, the philosopher Immanuel Kant begins his taxonomy of madness in his 1764 essay on the maladies of the head. And he says, there are three faculties of the human mind, experience, judgment, and reason. Consequently, there are three and exactly three basic forms of madness. And each form corresponds to a breakdown in one of the three faculties. And, and then if we contrast that with modern times, we're now onto the fifth edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, which I, I believe has something like 157 listed disorders. But despite this kind of explosion of diagnoses, the, the story doesn't appear to be one of settled science. So I wondered, in your research, what did you come to think about the way in which we've pursued a, a kind of definitive classification of mental suffering? Well, let's uh, maybe go back to a big picture perspective. So the purpose of the book generally was to really rewrite the history of psychiatry or rewrite the history of madness. And often enough, when historians 
write about the history of psychiatry. They write about it in terms of a clash or confrontation between these two views, a biological brain-based point of view and a psychological mind-based point of view, which is fine. And there's a lot of truth in that, but I wanted to use a slightly different lens. I wanted to look at the history of psychiatry uh, as a clash between these two paradigms, which I call madness as dysfunction and madness as strategy. And the basic idea behind madness as dysfunction is this notion that when somebody is mad, it's because something inside of them isn't working the way that it's supposed to. You know, as I said, something in your mind or your brain just isn't working right. Uh, you're looking at the person kind of like a broken machine, and your do job as doctor is to figure out how to fix that machine. And in some ways, what I'm calling madness as dysfunction is very harmful there might be some benefits to it, but in some ways it's very harmful because when I adopt it, I've already, as it were, decided to look at your words and your actions and your feelings as the byproduct of a broken mechanism that kind of robs you of a certain level of personhood or agency. And the other paradigm is what I call madness as strategy, where you're willing to see in madness uh, something like a purpose or a function or an adaptation. And I can come back to that later a bit more about what I mean by madness as strategy. But to answer your question, uh, the view that I'm calling madness as dysfunction is not new at all. It's actually very old. It goes back, as you know from the book, it goes back to the Hippocratic doctors. So if you look at this book, on the sacred disease, written probably around 400 uh, BC. The view that the author lays out very clearly there is that all the different forms of madness just stem from oxygen deprivation to different parts of the uh, brain. And it's interesting that you mentioned classification because once you have this basic idea that madness represents a disease or dysfunction, it becomes extremely tempting to want to classify the different forms of madness in terms of the different ways that the mind can fail to work the way it's supposed to work in the same way that you might want a listing of all the different ways that an automobile might fail to work the way that it's supposed to work. So you see this, you know, back in the ancient Hippocratic doctors, I think on the sacred disease, they probably allude to three or four different kinds of madness. Each one involved oxygen deprivation to a different part of the brain. You see this, as you mentioned, in the 18th century philosopher Immanuel Kant, where he says there's only three forms of madness because there are these three different faculties of the human mind. And so there are only three different ways that the mind can can break down. You see this in the DSM. You see this uh, in the RDoC. As I see it, they're all just versions of the same project, listing all the ways that the mind can uh, break. Of course, things are different today because uh, unlike Kant or the Hippocratics, we have many, many, many different ways that the mind can break down. And uh, apparently it's quite a lucrative business. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I, if it's okay, you know, to talk a little bit more then about kind of madness as dysfunction versus madness as, as strategy. And in reading the book, you do see this kind of gradual change, you know, and the, med the creeping medicalization to perhaps put psychiatry in, in charge when it's a dysfunction view. But it, it struck me immediately that if it's seen as, if madness is seen as a dysfunction, then it immediately, immediately puts the medical professional in charge. You know, they, they know the diagnosis, they know the outlook or prognosis, whatever else. But if you do look at it as madness as a strategy, then surely the person experiencing or having developed that strategy to avoid a painful reality is, is the one in charge. So, you know, it, it made me wonder if there are important reasons to think about madness outside of a medical context. And if so, are the benefits to thinking about madness in this way? Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, that's a great point. Uh, I, I do suspect that there is a very deep connection between what I'm calling madness as dysfunction and 
psychiatry as such. So sometimes I talk to psychiatrists uh, who say, look, you know, you're describing this one particular point of view, but we have a lot of different points of view. Sometimes we use what you're calling madness as dysfunction, and sometimes we use madness as strategy. And we take a very individualistic and pluralistic approach. But it does seem to me that to the extent that we think of psychiatry as a branch of medicine, then it has to be wedded at a very deep level to a dysfunction or a disease-centered view of madness. Otherwise, why would it fall under the authority of medicine? If you didn't think that madness was <laughs> something like a disease or something going wrong inside of you, then it's not clear why that would be a medical problem at all. So that's why I do think that despite the fact that there are some psychiatrists who take very progressive and I think path-breaking and interesting and different points of view on, on madness, I do think that the profession as a whole is wedded to a certain dysfunction-centered um, uh, point of view. So I guess the, the core shift that I would like to see is a shift from uh, pathology to purpose or a shift from what I would call madness as dysfunction to madness as strategy. Uh, and it's almost impossible to describe madness as strategy in the abstract. Uh, as you know, I have this blog with Psychology Today, and I use that blog to explore what I see as a lot of different research programs in mental health that exemplify what I'm calling madness as a strategy. So uh, if, if you wanted to, if any of the listeners wanted to find that, you can go to my website, which is just Justin garson.com and you'll see links to all the uh, uh, posts there. Uh, there I, I talk about depression. I talk about some of the personality disorders or so-called personality disorders. I talk about delusions, voice hearing, uh, some of the conditions that fall under the neurodiversity banner and what it would really mean to shift from a pathology to a purpose uh, point of view. But just to give you one example of what I'm talking about, uh, we can take depression. As you know, for decades, uh, we've been searching for this hypothetical uh, brain abnormality underlying uh, depression. That project has not panned out very well, as far as I'm aware. Uh, but there's a, a newer paradigm, which has been inspired by some of the evolutionary uh, thinkers. And in this paradigm, uh, depression is far from being a brain disease. It's something like your mind's evolved signal. It's something like a designed signal that your brain is giving you that something in your life needs to change, needs more attention. So in a way, the evolutionary theorists look at depression in the exact same way that we look at pain. So suppose you stub your toe, you feel this very, or burn your hand, you feel this excruciating pain, feeling the pain, that's not a disease, a disorder, or a dysfunction. That means everything inside of you is working exactly the way that it's supposed to. The pain is your body's natural signal to get yourself away from the source of danger. And so a lot of the evolutionary thinkers see depression and anxiety in the same way as something like your brain's functional signal that something that there's something in your environment that needs more uh, attention. So that's that would be one example of shifting from a pathology to a purpose viewpoint on depression. Now, if that's true, that would have profound implications for research, for treatment, uh, for stigma. Uh, so think about treatment. If I'm treating somebody for depression, the first question isn't going to be, okay, let's look for some hypothetical uh, chemical imbalance that's creating your depression. The first question is going to be, okay, what in your life might this be a response to? It's probably not something really obvious. It's probably something that's not entirely obvious, but something real that needs more attention. I think it would also change our readiness to medicate it. I'm not saying that medication has no place at all in depression, but if we do think of depression on the model of a functional signal, uh, then the first step is probably not going to be to bombard it with drugs. The first step is going to be looking at what 
in your life, it might be a response too. And then finally, I, th I think it has deep implications for uh, stigma. So there's a researcher that I've been working with, a psychologist at the University of Michigan. His name is Hans Schroeder. And he studies the psychological impact of different ways of framing depression. So he'll literally get together a huge number of volunteers who have had experience with depression. Half of them, he'll give them a dysfunction-centered message. He'll say something like, you know, we now know that depression stems from some kind of a chemical imbalance in your brain, and it can be treated in one of various ways. Group two, he'll say, we now know that depression is something like, kind of like pain. It's like your mind's functional signal that something in your life needs more attention. And then he looks at the impact that these different messages have on people. And what he's found is that people who are exposed to this function framing uh, tend to be more optimistic about treatment. They tend to think, oh, okay, this is something that I can get a hold of. Uh, they tend to um, uh, feel that their depression has some important insights to offer them, and they tend to feel less stigma about their depression. They tend to feel more inclined to talk with other people about their uh, depression. So that's a lot to say, but I think that there are a lot of far-ranging implications of thinking of what we call madness in, in terms of purpose. It's fascinating to kind of think about how much shame it takes out for people when when they they might think for themselves well actually i'm in a perfectly understandable place this is perfectly understandable reaction to some horrible circumstances that i've been in rather than give them a message that there's a mechanism that we can't really explain in your brain but we're just going to chuck chemicals at it and hope it somehow resolves itself so you know i i was really heartened actually to read that you know if you encourage people to think of this understandable reaction, then it, it, it tends to be quite positive for them and their experience of, of the whole situation changes. I really do think that over the last decade, and I've written about this some in the Psychology Today blog, I, I do think that psychologists are discovering just how disempowering and stigmatizing these biomedical framings are, which is a surprise because in the 80s, I remember very clearly uh, when they would say, oh, you know, once we start thinking of mental illness on the model of diseases, once we get everybody to think that depression is kind of like diabetes or schizophrenia is kind of like cancer, then we're going to have this golden age where suddenly people will not feel stigmatized and they'll not feel at fault and they'll be able to talk about it. And I think it's really the last decade we're seeing that okay, these messages can actually be extremely disempowering and stigmatizing in perhaps a different way than we anticipated. Justin, I wondered, you know, what your thoughts were on how it is that the medical model has become so deeply entrenched in our society, our culture, because it's interesting, isn't it? If you talk with friends or whatever, and, and you, you, you talk about people suffering and suffering mental distress, and you mention poverty and inequality and injustice or whatever else it might be, then, the, you know, they kind of get that those things can make can put people in a very different difficult place but if you talk about mental illness in that regard then it, it if the conversation very quickly becomes scientific and medicalized and you know psychiatrists are the experts and whatever so you know th this medical biomedical narrative has really taken hold hasn't it I mean, that's such a huge question. I think there are so many factors uh, I mean, as you know, in my view, there's this dysfunction-centered view that's very old, and we see it repeatedly throughout history, but I think you're absolutely right. Something happened around the 1970s and 1980s, and this medical dysfunction-centered view just became entrenched in our collective consciousness, and the way that we think and talk about mental illness to the point where people often get offended if you suggest that what we call madness or mental illness is anything other than medical problem. And I, I think there are so many reasons why that change took place. I'm actually writing a book about that very topic uh, right now that'll be coming out uh, in a couple years with St. Martin's Press, exploring from the point of view of one particular uh, psychiatrist named Solomon Snyder. I'm kind of looking at, at his life and exploring how this medical point of view kind of took hold partly through his actions and advocacy. Uh, Snyder was really the innovator of this 
dopamine hypothesis of schizophrenia in the 1970s. He did a lot of important work. He discovered the brain's dopamine receptor. He showed that uh, the first generation antipsychotic drugs primarily seem to work by blocking up dopamine receptors. And on the basis of that, he formulated what seemed like a very simple and appealing idea, namely schizophrenia just comes from the dysregulation of your uh, dopamine neurons. And thanks to that dopamine hypothesis, that really opened the floodgates for this biomedical perspective. There had been a lot of people, obviously, throughout the century who had endorsed a biomedical disease-centered perspective in contrast to, say, psychoanalysts or people with a more uh, sociological uh, orientation. But I think that the dopamine hypothesis and then later this uh, serotonin hypothesis really gave ammunition to this biomedical point of view. And they, they were able to say, look, this is no longer a speculation. This is basic science that we're dealing with. But yeah, there are so many, there's, there are a lot of factors, I think, that influence that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and of course, it was an open door, open goal then for the pharmaceutical industry, wasn't it, with their massive marketing dollars? You know, it wasn't, wasn't the the slogan that, that accompanied the marketing of Prozac was better than well, wasn't it? So they suddenly saw themselves as able to chemically manipulate people's behavior. So not only were they treating a disease, but they could apparently improve people's lives. And a lot of the marketing went along with that. Right. I mean, once you have this what seems to be a scientifically vindicated idea that these major mental disorders can now be explained in terms of neurotransmitter abnormalities in the brain. That is an open field, obviously, for pharmaceutical companies to come along and say, and hey, guess what? We have exactly the drug that's going to reverse that chemical imbalance. And one person I really uh, have come to respect quite a lot is Johanna Moncrief. And I think that she sees something that a lot of historians miss which is that one of the factors that really led to the entrenchment of the biomedical view was not the availability of these drugs. Most of the drugs that are on the market today are versions of stuff that's been around since the 1950s. It was this changed philosophical and conceptual understanding of what these drugs actually do. Drugs like uh, chlorpromazine, drugs like Prozac, they don't work just by helping you to uh, uh, dampen your emotions. They're not just tranquilizers. They are specific, targeting, underlying chemical abnormalities. And I think she's absolutely right that the medical psychiatry and the pharmaceutical companies, they needed a vision like that. It wasn't enough to say, look, these drugs seem to help some folks. Maybe they'll help you too. <laughs> we needed to have this idea of these drugs reverse a, uh, a chemical imbalance. And I do think that's why she's gotten so much uh, uh, flack. Uh, she gets criticized so heavily uh, by psychiatrists because by questioning that, assumption by questioning the idea that these drugs work by reversing chemical abnormalities in the brain, you're unraveling the whole basis of this solidification of medical psychiatry in the, in the 80s. It's a very dangerous thing to say. It absolutely is re removing the foundation stones, isn't it, from the whole story of mental illness and chemical imbalances and, and drugs to fix problems that, although we can't actually define them and can't tell you how they occur, then, you know, trust us that take these drugs and, and you'll be fine. Where we, we, we know, you know, I have personal experience myself and I've spoken with many people who, you know, the, the effects of the drugs given for the problem often cause more problems than the issue that you're dealing with in the first place. Yeah, I mean, not only do they cause some problems, and again, I don't doubt that they help some people, but if I'm going to take <laughs> these medications, it, I'd rather just know, look, we don't really know why they work. They seem to help some folks. Maybe they'll help you, uh, and, uh, and then I'd take my chances. But certainly it's true for me in the uh, late 80s, and it was certainly true for a lot of people then. I assume it's still true for a lot of people now that I wouldn't have taken these drugs if I didn't actually believe that they weren't reversing some kind of a chemical imbalance. That, that was the basic presumption that I had when I took these drugs. I didn't just want to take drugs that would somehow uh, impact my mind uh, 
uh, in such a way as to make me feel a bit better. Uh, and so, Justin, you know, while kind of reading your book and, and you know, thinking about what, what you'd said in your book and perhaps other books that I've read around these kind of areas, you know, it's plain that there's a, a, a huge amount out there of fantastic academic work looking at is the benefit in thinking more widely about how we conceptualize mental suffering or distress or, or, or madness. And yet, of course, you know, wh when, when you get out into the real world, then the whole mental health conversation is still very medicalized. It's still really the purview of doctors and, and psychiatrists. So I, I think you yourself have said that people have the right to be exposed to different frameworks for making sense of their suffering, as long as those frameworks are scientifically credible. So, I, you know, I guess my question is, how do we start to cut through this dominance of the medical model narrative, do you think? Yeah, that's a great question. How do we start to change things? Uh well, one, let me just say a, a word about this notion of the the medical model itself, because I, I often run into this kind of objection where I'll talk to folks who say, look, psychiatry isn't really using a medical model anymore. We've moved past that. We now have a biopsychosocial uh, model, which is very pluralistic and very tailored to the needs of the individual. And to me, I see this, all this talk of the biopsychosocial model is really the proverbial uh, wolf in sheep's clothing. To me, the whole question is, look, are you seeing madness as a dysfunction? Are you seeing it in terms of something inside the person not working the way that it's supposed to? That, seeing madness as a dysfunction, is perfectly compatible with taking a biopsychosocial approach. I mean, you can take a biopsychosocial approach to cancer. You can take a biopsychosocial approach to diabetes. You should take a biopsychosocial approach to these various diseases, but that doesn't mean that you've moved at all away from a disease or a dysfunction um, uh, mentality. So I do see that the biopsychosocial is really just a, it's kind of the medical model in, in disguised. It's a more sophisticated, uh, maybe a more philosophically sophisticated version of the medical model. Uh, and on the topic of changing paradigms, uh, I, to some extent, I'm skeptical that psychiatrists will be the ones to lead the way in this movement. And it's not necessarily just because they have so much at stake, but I think part of the extensive medical training that they get is just reinforcing the idea that they are at root dealing with diseases or disorders. They need to uh, uh, fix them. As I said, there are a lot of psychiatrists who do not fit that mold, who I think are doing really great, groundbreaking, important work, trying to move away from dysfunction-centered framings. I respect them profoundly. Uh, but I do think that as long as we see psychiatry as a branch of medicine, as an institution, psychiatry is going to remain wedded to these dysfunction center models. So I think it really falls on each of us to take as many opportunities as we can simply to promote new models and simply to promote alternative models. I like to think of what I'm doing as trying to kind of clog up the infosphere with different models of, of, uh, of, uh, of madness. And I've been fortunate in some ways because I've had some platforms that I can do that with, like Eon, like Mad in America, uh, like Psychology Today, uh, the book I mentioned that's going to be coming out uh, with St. Martin's Press. But I, I do think at this point, it really is about finding creative ways of just getting these alternative framings out there to the public and to the people who really need to hear them the most. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. That's so important. And, and then perhaps, you know, if, if we look towards the future a little bit, so if, if we were to move away from a medicalized view of madness, and if we were to embrace the idea that madness has purpose and we can learn from it, how could we or how should we organize ourselves to best fit people struggling? So, you know, are, are there lessons from history that can be useful or, or do you think we haven't really yet found a way forward? Yeah, that's a, <laughs> another great question and another huge question. Um, I can't really say what mental health will look like in the future. What should it look like if 
I mean, obviously it's going to look very different for different people who are experiencing distressing or disturbing or even just extreme uh, states of consciousness. Uh, I do think there are, are a lot of non-pathologizing approaches to mental health. Uh, I suppose that the most exciting and promising of these are projects that are led by mad people, by service users, by ex-patients, by people who have been diagnosed as having serious uh, mental illnesses. So, of course, you have projects like uh, the Hearing Voices Network or the Open Dialogue Movement or Soteria Houses. Uh, and from what I understand, these really put the emphasis on peer support and on exploring alternative, non-pathologizing framings of these uh, extreme experiences. And as I've said, and I thank you for pointing out, I don't entirely reject medical framings of certain kinds of uh, distressing or extreme experiences, but I do believe uh, firmly that everybody has the right to be exposed to different models, different frameworks for making sense of their experiences, so long as these are scientifically uh, credible, not just uh, made up. So in some ways, I do feel very hopeful about the future. Your whole point that if people see madness as a strategy, that puts those people in the driving seat to be part of their own recovery, if recovery is what they need or what they look for. But if it remains in the medical domain, then they're kind of always relegated to a second role, aren't they, of listening to a professional or an expert when probably they are the expert in their own experience. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I do think what I call madness as strategy uh, is just one alternative paradigm for getting away from this dysfunction. So I'll just call it a dysfunction-centered model. Because when I talk about the medical model, people say, oh, there is no medical model or we've moved past the medical model. But yes, as I see it, madness as strategy is one promising alternative to the dysfunction-centered model. But I have no doubt that there are other alternatives. But that's, I like the way you put it. It's about putting the person in the driver's seat and giving them tools to think about and make sense of and possibly change the way that they're uh, uh, experiencing the world in a way that doesn't relegate it uh, to some kind of a, you know, the byproduct of a disease process. Again, there are some people for whom that might be a useful and valid way of seeing things. And I don't, I don't want to rob anybody of something that's going to be a useful and valuable tool, but that certainly doesn't deserve to have the, the dysfunction view, certainly doesn't deserve the dominance that it's, it's come to acquire. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, Justin, it, it's just been fascinating to talk to you today. And, you know, your book was really mind expanding in, in the best possible way, you know, and, and to get an appreciation of the way that we've thought differently about madness over all the years and the fact that it isn't really sorted even now, we've still got work to do on that. It was just amazing to read all that. And so thank you for spending some time with us today. Yeah. And, and thank you, James. I do really appreciate uh, your taking the time to come up with these really um, just interesting and insightful questions. And I, I really appreciated our, our conversation. So my thanks to Justin once again for taking the time to join us. If you'd like to know more about his work, you can find him on the web at justingarson.com. And he is also active on Twitter, where he can be found by the username at Justin underscore Garson. So thank you as always for listening. And until next time, take care. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. For more news, views and updates, visit maddenamerica.com.